Hey Indie Mogulers, Griffin here. Today I want to give you the four essential ingredients for shooting your documentary. Whether your camera is an Ari Alexa or an iPhone, there are the same four creative considerations that make documentaries look like documentaries. In fact, this is the quickest way to upgrade from what I think looks like amateur home video style shooting to actually making what looks like a film. So when your non-video friend comes up to you and says, hey, I'm going on the trip of a lifetime to Patagonia, what do I shoot with my new camera? I think this is the easiest way to teach that. Just tell your friend there are four essential elements of documentary. And the first one is an interview, also called a talking head or a soundbite. We also refer to them in television news as a SOT, sound on tape, which is definitely an outdated phrase because there's no tape involved anymore. Right now I'm recording audio through XLR right into the camera, which is how I do most of my interviews. But I like the phrase SOT because it's a really short acronym. It's shorter than writing out interview when I'm naming my files after I've shot the film. So I can just say David Tran SOT, and I know exactly what that is. These are really important as the documentarian to capture because I'm learning a lot of information and I'm getting a great audio track that I can use to build my film. Honestly, the way that I like to edit, I may only use the actual talking headshot for a second here, a second there. It's really that audio that I need. People want to see the detail in the fur. They want to see the eyes of the animal. They want to see these little gnats that are flying in front of us. So the second element of documentary is VO, voiceover. And I like voiceover because people seem to like my voice. Hey, Indie Mogulers. Hey, Indie Mogulers. Hey, Indie Mogulers. So for me, it's a free asset I have. I don't have to hire uh, extra talent, a voiceover artist. I can just do my own voiceover for my film. My neighborhood in Lower Manhattan is especially bright and colorful. So I visited a local neon sign maker to see. I do think that voiceover can be a crutch. If your whole film is voiceover, then you have to ask yourself, why am I not conveying this information effectively through visuals? Why are my interviews not conveying this information? Uh, but I do think that voiceover can be a nice through line to take all the things you learned in interviews that maybe you had to cut out for timing reasons and you can string your film together with voiceover. Less than a mile away, Vanessa's dumplings are slightly more expensive. I tell her I have just come from Tasty Dumpling. The third element of documentary is B-roll. And there's a reason that I put B-roll in this quadrant above interviews, because that's primarily the purpose of B-roll. B-roll is all the wonderful shots that you captured while shooting your documentary, all the close-ups and medium shots and wide shots of all the details in the film. And you're primarily using them to cover up the interview. You put them on top of the interview, because you can imagine how boring a documentary would be if it was just a talking headshot for the entire time, and you would have no ability to cut out anything from the interview. So yeah, B-roll also covers up voiceover. So in television, a VO piece, a voiceover piece, is a piece that's just B-roll. So often when I worked in news, I would just shoot a bunch of beautiful B-roll shots, package them together into a 30 second or 60 second clip, and then they could just play it during the broadcast. During a live show when the anchors are talking, you can cut away to this B-roll. Today, in order to finish it within four days. One thing you should know about B-roll, if you've never shot a documentary or a television news story, is that you need a lot more of it than you think you do. You wanna give yourself options in the edit especially when you shoot B-roll before you shoot your interview, because the interview may reveal what are the things that you're talking about that I need to see. And in fact, I like to shoot B-roll before I ever get to the interview. I don't want to show up and do the interview first when my relationship with the subject isn't there yet. I might want to spend a few hours shooting some B-roll, even if I don't really know what I'm supposed to be capturing yet, just spending that time getting the subject comfortable, then when we sit down and do the interview, they'll be a better subject and they'll trust me more to, to give me good answers. So shoot a lot of B-roll. Sometimes I think the ratio is like 60 to one of what you'll need. I shot a five minute film called Hand Cut about ice in cocktails, but it had eight hours of interviews and B-roll. When I made Sriracha, a 33-minute documentary, I had 32 hours of interviews and B-roll. So shoot a lot of stuff, because, well, if you're like me, you may uh, want to cram a lot of shots into the film.
Here's the power of B-roll. I'm gonna play you an uncut moment from an interview in my film, Hand Cut. Well, I'm finished with ice sculptures, at least in this portion of my life. And we're gonna change over to uh, more of a, a non-specialty ice product, something standard like cubes and cut cubes and dry ice and selling block ice. So that sounded okay. He didn't stutter or cough. Sometimes I'll, I'll cut those things out. But I do think from just an efficiency standpoint, I can cut this down in length and still convey the same information. So here I'll make two cuts and we'll see how this sounds. Well, I'm finished with ice sculptures, at least in this portion of my life. And we're gonna change over to something standard like cubes and cut cubes and selling block ice. So those are very clearly jump cuts. They feel pretty awkward when you can hear the cut, you can see the cut at the exact same time, we're not cutting to something else. You know exactly what I've done. And sometimes I'm okay as a filmmaker putting a jump cut in a film and letting the audience know about the editing. But generally, we kind of want to hide the production process from the audience and just let them get wrapped up in the story. One thing I want to challenge you to though is let's watch that again. And this is something I do when I'm editing these sound bites. Once you make a jump cut, it's pretty obvious when you're looking at it uh, that it's happening. It's very jarring to see. But the real test is can you hear it? So I want you to watch it one more time and just close your eyes. And yes, the jump cuts are there, but if you can't hear the edit, then it's okay. We're, we can cover it up with B-roll. And as long as we can't hear that edit, it's fine. Well, I'm finished with ice sculptures, at least in this portion of my life. We're going to change over to something standard like cubes and cut cubes and selling block ice. So yeah, now that I've listened to it, I know that it sounds okay. So here's the version with B-roll on top. Well, I'm finished with ice sculptures, at least in this portion of my life. We're going to change over to something standard like cubes and cut cubes and selling block ice. One caveat I will mention about these first three elements of documentary is if you're shooting a cinema verite documentary, cinema verite means cinema truth, then you may not have a formal interview and you probably won't have voiceover because cinema verite is about showing up with a camera and just documenting what's actually happening, which you may not want to stage an interview for that. But most documentaries will have these elements. And the final element of documentary is a nat sound break. Nat sound is short for natural sound. We also call it wild sound. And when I'm shooting documentary, I'm always capturing nat sound, whether it's on a microphone hidden here under the shot, or even if it's just the on-camera microphone. Uh, for nat sound, I'm okay with the on-camera microphone. You know, just hearing the street sound or anything like that, that's natural sound. And a nat sound break is where you just let that audio live on its own for a moment in the film. So, you know, maybe the music continues, but you drop out the sound bites, the voiceover, and you just let the gnat sound live for a moment. They're still wild animals, and you have to travel with a group of people. In hand cut, it's chipping away at the ice, just letting the audience hear that. It's about, you know, 20 to 30 drinks. Uh, in television news, it's often called a gnat sound pop. That's just one more audio element, really, that's helping you tell your story. And so these are the four elements, interview, voiceover, B-roll, and Nat sound break that I'm thinking about. Am I capturing all these things when I'm out in the field? These are the four elements that I talk about when I give workshops on how to shoot documentaries. It's a very audio heavy list. And this is what I think about when I'm making documentary. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, if you learned something today, then I think you'll also like this new crash course I've put together on documentary filmmaking. This is a workshop that I've taught all around the world in many different countries, and I'm excited to finally bring it to you, make it available online. It's an hour talking about elements of documentary, storytelling structure, the gear that I use, editing tips, and it's all available at griffinhammond.com slash crash. It's $10, but I do want to make it available to indie mogulers for half price. So it's only $5 if you use the coupon code mogul. Again, that's at griffinhammond.com slash crash.